Good afternoon, everyone. Let's get started. So uh, today we are going to talk about lecture 13, Transformers and LLM, the second part of Transformers and Large Language Models. In today's lecture, we are going to see several techniques to compress large language models by using quantization and also sparsity and also those advanced inference systems techniques such as uh, um, VLLM um, and also the page to attention. So this is going to be the today's agenda, starting with efficient inference algorithms. Uh, we are going to review several techniques like quantization, pruning, and also systems, VLM, streaming LM, uh, flash attention, speculative de decoding, and finally efficient fine-tuning techniques. How do we customize the large language models by using LoRa adapter prompt tuning techniques? Okay, so let's start with uh, quantization. So we'll introduce actually three techniques, including smooth quant for 8-bit uh, quantization and AWQ for 4-bit quantization, and finally tiny chat that implements those 4-bit quantized model on hardware. And these techniques has been integrated by the uh, NVIDIA Tensor RT LLM, which was just open source the last week. So this is a pretty timely lecture. Welcome to try the TRT LLM. Let's review what is quantization we've covered in lecture five and also, and also lecture six. Basically, we map uh, the range of the floating point range into integer values. Okay, so we have the Q min and Q max. We have a zero point mapping the zero point to the floating, floating number zero. Uh, so this is an example of two bit quantization where we have four centroid, where each centroid is representing like from minus two, minus one, zero, and one. So can we directly apply the quantization techniques we've learned in lecture uh, in the previous lecture to large language model? Actually, we tried it, but it failed. Right when the large the model gets larger, uh, more than uh, six billion parameters, the performance degradation is actually actually pretty severe. You see a pretty big accuracy degradation when the model gets larger. So um, we find actually this is due to large language model has outliers in the activations, making the large language model difficult to quantize. So let's see, what is the, um, uh, what is the outliers? So this is showing uh, the outliers in the activation. So this is showing the weight. What is the difference here? So laws of outliers, like this channel, this channel, this channel, these three channels has values that is much larger than the remaining uh, than the remaining channels. But the weight is pretty flat. The range is pretty small between 0 and 1. But here the value of the activation is between 0 and 70, even larger than 70. So such large dynamic range makes activation difficult to quantize. But the weight are really is so easy to quantize. So how do we deal with it? A natural thinking, a very smart way to think about it is actually and we um, multiply this channel by a, like 0 0.1 and enlarge the weight by 10 times. Even enlarging it by 10 times, it's still pretty small. And the key principle is that matrix multiplication is linear. Right? X times W, we can multiply X by 0 0.1, and we can multiply W by 10, so the final result is still the same. So in this way, we can flatten, smooth, those activations to make it feel more flat, where we no longer have those big values. Okay, and here is this uh, the weight. The weight is harder to quantize due to it's slightly more bumpy than this case, but it's still compared with here, it's still relatively easy to quantize. So here we effectively migrated the quantization difficulty from the activation to the weight, making them. Um, easy to quantize. So how do we do that in practice? So this is showing an example where we have activation, we have the weight. Initially, you have two outlier channels. So here we have pretty big channel, minus 16, 8. And here you have a pretty big channel, 6 and 9. And the weight is relatively flat. And we calculate a, uh, a scaling factor. A scaling factor are 1, 4, 1, 3, which is uh, obtained by um, 
dividing the, the, the number having the square root of the max of the x and also the max of w. Okay? So the max of x, for example, here, the max is 16. The max of the w here is 1. So divide, it, divide that, and then you have the square root of that, you get 4 in this position. Okay? In that way, we can convert the matrix multiplication in another way. They are mathematically equal. Like 16 multiplied by 1 equal to 4 minus, uh, times 4. Okay? And similar here, um, 8 times 1 equal to uh, 2 times 4. So they are still mathematically equal. But here, we no longer have these huge outlier channels in the smooth quantization activation. Right? So this effectively smooths the, quant uh, the activation. And what is the, uh, there's no free lunch, right? You smooth the activation. What is the uh, overhead here? Which one gets harder to quantize? The weight, right? Previously, the weight is just super easy to quantize. One, two, right? But now uh, it gets slightly harder, but still within our control. Slightly harder, but still okay to be quantized. So by using this way, everything is still mathematically equal. And how do we deal with this scaling factor? Do we have to introduce some actual computation to do such um, matrix quantification? Like we are multiplying um, s to the power of minus 1 to x, and we are multiplying s to w. Since this one, these two, they cancel each other, they are identity matrix. So we need to add extra computing to here. For weight, it's easy. We can fold the scaling factor to the weight offline, right? And for the activation, this is a hyperparameter, it's a constant number, no matter what input it is. So we can fold this into the layer norm of the previous layer. Right? Last lecture, we introduced the layer norm, uh, which is having a bias, having a scaling factor. So here we are exploiting that, that scaling factor uh, to uh, multiply the certain channels. So that can be folded into the previous uh, normalization layer. So at the runtime, there's no extra overhead at all. So mathematically equal, no runtime overhead. Everything can be computed during compile time. So here we, uh, we can quantize both the weight and activations for all those compute intensive kernels, including the QKV transformation, uh, DMM in the attention, uh, QK transpose, and um, at times V, finally the output projection layer, and two FFN layers. Okay? Only these layer norm softmax layers is capped in FP16. So now we can match the accuracy. Previously, we lose the accuracy when the model is larger than 6.7 billion. Now the accuracy recovered. And let's see, what about the latency and also the memory? So previously, this is the uh, previous memory. Now the memory is reduced by half. Okay? So in order to serve uh, this is OPT-175 billion parameter model used to require um, this 8 A100 GPU to serve that. Now we, we need only four, okay? Reduce the number of GPUs by half. Now each GPU is pretty expensive. It's like 20K each. And now you immediately, sa immediately saved 80K dollars. What about the latency? Like in this, in this case, it's even faster, lower latency, since we don't need to communicate. Uh, everything is quantized to int 8 rather than FP16. And there's no commu less communication, um, so, the latency is even faster. What about even larger model, like um, uh, NLG, uh, MTL, uh, Megatron Turing NLG 530 billion parameter model? So the accuracy is pretty well maintained. And here we can reduce the number of serving GPUs from 16 to 8. So each node is super expensive, it's like 200K for, uh, for uh, 200 and 300k for H100 and 180k for A100. So each node is pretty expensive. We can reduce it by, by half and also keep the latency the same. What about newer models like LAMA? In the last lecture, we introduced 
uh, the open source model Llama, Llama 1, Llama 2. So what's the new, uh, what's new here? It introduced the Swish, uh, Swish GLU, right? Use the Swish activation function, turning those full, two fully connected layer into three layers, gated linear unit, referred to the last lecture, and also introduced this rotary relative positional encoding, if you remember that from the last lecture. Will these advanced changes impact the quantization? Actually, uh, smooth quant still works very well for this case to quantize llama families, llama one, llama two, to make a large llama into a smaller llama. Um, this is llama 7b, 13b, 30b, all the way to 65b. Um, this is the perplexity. It's well, very well maintained on the Wikitext data set. So smooth quant makes the weight and activation into 8 bit, right? By smoothing the activations, pushing the quantization difficulty from the activation to the weight, um, improving, the, uh, throughput, uh, improving the throughput for large language model. What about the batch size is small, okay? In the edge scenario or real time interaction, like you wanna to talk to a robot, one-to-one um, -one conversation. When the batch size is small, we observe, uh, this is the uh, real flying model, Okay, the x-axis is the compute intensity. The y-axis is the measured uh, t-ops per second. When the batch size is one, there is actually a pretty low utilization. This is your peak, peak um, t-ops per second. This is the measured t-ops per second. It's very well underutilized. It's highly because it's highly memory bounded, right? Uh, because large language models are pretty big. Like Llama 2, 7B has 7 billion parameters. If you're using FP16, how many storage do you need? That's 14 gigabytes, right? 14 gigabytes, that's pretty big. You have to fetch 14 gigabytes in an auto-regressive manner, which means generating each token requires 14 gigabytes of memory access. Remember, computation is cheap, memory is expensive. We have to, we want to reduce those memory footprints. And compared with the activate uh, the weight, the activation is actually small, right? So the weight is like 4K by 4K, um, but the activation, if it's single batch, is like one by 4K. It's a thousand times smaller. Therefore, we should focus on compressing the weight. So that's why we introduce uh, this low bit weight only quantization. We are also going to see that in the homework. So that's why we need such uh, weight-only quantization to reduce the memory bandwidth. Uh, previously, we have to fetch uh, 14 gigabytes of memory. What about if we quantize the weight to four bit for Llama 7B? What is the memory footprint now? Three and a half, right? Three and a half gigabyte, four times smaller. So this is naively doing that from, uh, this is a weight matrix. So in the, using the FP16 representation, the four eight by four matrix, this is the quantized version. It's again eight by four, but it's quantized uh, using um, three bit in this case, easy uh, to, to show it. But immediately we see this perplexity degradation. The lower the perplexity, the better the quality. But here, unfortunately, <coughs> there's a huge jump um, of the perplexity if we naively quantize it. Perplexity is a measurement of the quality of a language model. It's showing the, uh, the accuracy of predicting the next word, whether you are accurately predicting the next word or not. So the lower, the better. So unfortunately, directly doing front to nearest quantization using three bit hurt the accuracy a lot. Uh, even if we're using this uh, group-wise quantization, so here every um, 128 numbers are quantized together and we have a shared scaling factor, a finer granularity of shared uh, scaling factor every uh, 128 elements, which we covered in the second lecture of this of quantization part. Interestingly, we find not all the weights are equally important. 
just by quantizing 1%, um, keep 1% of the roles in FP16, can help a lot immediately bring back the perplexity for the original value. This is so amazing. We seem to find a way to quantize that, right? Only keep 1% into FP16. Um, like here, only one channel, keep it as uh, the same as before. Just don't quantize it. And immediately bring back uh, the perplexity, the quality. Okay. So therefore, we have two natural uh, to-dos. One to-do is to think about how do we choose those um, sailing channels? Which channel is important? There exists, so the channel is only 1% of the channel. But how do we systematically select those 1% of the channels? And second to do is keeping IP16 will make the inference kernel difficult. How do we get rid of this mix of precision and still use full quantization? Everything will be in blue rather than having 1% in, in yellow. So let's answer those two questions. When we are doing pruning, how to select these important weights? Which one to prune? Which one to remove? We do look at the weight itself, right? If it is large, we think, oh, that's an important weight, important channel. We should keep it. What if we do it here? We look at the weight. If it is large, we just remove or keep it. Otherwise, we remove it. Unfortunately, the price is pretty high. And we did another way. Don't look at the weight. Since weight is multiplied with the expectation, let's just have those activations. Since during smooth quant, we find some activations are pretty huge. We want to preserve those outlier channels. So say this is an outlier channel. This is a pretty big activation channel. And that is consistent for different inputs, different tokens. They're all big channels. And then if this channel is big in the activation, this corresponding weight is considered salient or important. We should keep them. So using this way, the activation, not the weight. That's why we call it activation aware weight only quantization. You are quantizing the weight, but you look at activation to, to determine which weight is salient. By looking at the activation's uh, magnitude, it's easier um, to recover the perplexity. So we solve the first to do and look at the activation, not the weight, to determine those 1% saving channels. Then we have the second to do, right? Um, can we re uh, don't, not rely on this mixed precision? Still use all FP, sorry, all int 4 or all int 3 to get rid of this mixed precision. We tried a very simple technique. We just multiply uh, this weight channel by two and divide the activation channel by two. So they are mathematically equal, like smooth part. Um, so by multiplying it from like 1.5, 2, and 4, we find um, this is a very effective way to recover the perplexity without introducing um, this FP16, 1% of channels in FP16, just multiply that salient channel by a number larger than 1 and bring back um, this perplexity. This is so amazing. Previously, we have to rely on 1% rely on of the channels being, quant uh, being unquantized in FP16, making the kernel difficult to write. But now, just multiply the salient channel by a larger number and it will recover. Another but another problem came. How, we, how large should we multiply that channel? Like here, you first see um, the perplexity decrease and the increase. So there must be a sweet spot. Uh, we want to automatically search um, uh, the multiplier. So let's see, analyze first. Why enlarging the channel make it easier to recover the perplexity? So this layer is not denoted by weight times the activation. And then we care about the quantization error from the quantized version of the W times X. Okay. 
Um, so QW, quantized version of W, basically equal to, uh, we, uh, this is defining the, the range. Okay, we divide the range by the number of centroids. Since you have n bits, they are to the power of n minus one um, centroids. And this is the distance between each centroid. And then we um, give W divided by this number and multiply this number to the in the outside. And we have to round it uh, to the nearest integer. So that's the quantized version of W. If we, what if we scale that? Like here, we scale it by like 1.5, by two, for those salient weight. What happened to that? So we scale up the weight, and we have to scale down the activation. Okay? So previously it's Q, um, um, QW times X, now it's QW times S, uh, times X divided by S. So they are still mathematically equal. S gets canceled here. If we plug in WS into the uh, representation for the Q, uh, we can see SW is here since W becomes SW, and X divided by S is here. What happened here is that the rounding function always has an expect, expectation of 0 0.25. Since rounding is always, the rounding error ranges from 0 to 0 0.5, right? Like 1.5 get rounded to 2, 1.75 get rounded to 2 as well. The average is 0 and 0.25, it's a quarter which is between 0 and 0 0.5. So this doesn't change. Um, what about this delta? Okay, so this delta is only dependent, is only dependent on the maximum of the weight. So there are a group of weights in the vertical dimension. Um, and the group size is 128. Uh, just scale up one channel, it's very unlikely to change the max value. Unless 1 in 125, 128, you hit that max value. Otherwise, you are not going to change it. So this, w, uh, this delta is not going to change. But only this s is something, s is larger than 1, so this error is scaled down. Okay? So when the s is greater than 1, the error is scaled down. That's why scaling up, scaling up the salient channel can achieve the same effect of making that channel to be MP16. Before the quantization. So this is easier to quantize. Okay, so we scaled it up, and then the equation is very similar to smooth quant, make it easy uh, to in, uh, for industry to put into products. Right? Same infrastructure, you can do either smooth quant or AWQ. So here we times uh, w times s, x divided by s. This can be fused to the previous operation, or fused into the layer norm. And then we take a data-driven approach to do a, a fast grade search to search the uh, best scaling factor, which is greater than one. And later follow-up work even propose a learning-based method to use gradient descent to learn the best scaling factor. So this is 3-bit, uh, group size 128, and LAMA, uh, and also LAMA2. Uh, AWQ shows consistent better performance compared with round to nearest, or GPTQ or GPTQR, um, like 7B all the way to 30B models. It also work, out, work well for multi-model large language model, which we are going to introduce in the next lecture on region transformers. So this is Flamingo, for image captioning, um, this is comparison with different baselines, actually a pretty significant improvement about the uh, accuracy here. Given this image, the round to nearest baseline quantization model says, a model airplanes flying in the sky. AWQ can say two toy airplanes sitting on a grass field. This one baseline model is saying a man is holding a baby elephant in his arm versus AWQ says a man, his daughter, pose with an elephant. Uh, the last one, a man and a dog walking past some bushes, versus AWQ, two dogs are walking on the street. And even 
um, use lava, quantize lava to do visual reasoning. Like given this, uh, there is some caption here, but this is all represented in the image format, although it has some text. You have to automatically to do OCR to understand it. Some chicken like roadmap. Uh, the baseline quantization RTN model says there are small pictures of the Earth and other planets placed on top of the food versus AWQ says a lighthearted and humorous take on the concept of looking at the pieces of the Earth from space. A plate of fried food, especially chicken nuggets, is presented with the caption. And the caption is actually exactly the same as the caption here. So it means uh, this vision language model is automatically doing the OCR to understand uh, the text here. Uh, one more example, it's able to recognize this who is painting who painted this, Leonardo da Vinci. Okay, so uh, smooth quantum AWQ are widely used these days. That's why we also put it in the homework uh, in the lab four, which we released last week. Uh, we we'll give you the code and also it will pave the way for lab five, which we are going to actually implement that on the laptop. Um, NVIDIA Faster Transformer and Tensor RTLM. This is the library run uh, large language model inference, which is actually a pretty amazing library released actually last week. How amazing, how timely we are. Um, the Tensor RTLM, the intro, uh, the, uh, they are using the smooth quant um, and AWQ as their quantization approaches. Also, Intel will change Berkeley's VLM, which we're going to talk about that. Berkeley fast chat, uh, hugging face, and since time, and several open source community have been using that. Okay, so how do we translate this uh, theoretical saving into measured speed up? And can we deploy this large language model on edge devices, like on our laptops, our phones? Okay, so I'm going to introduce Tiny Chat, which is a lightweight chatbot for large language model on the edge. This is what we designed, 3D printed computer, which has a JSON Ori Nano inside. Um, and we also have a demo here on the right. So deploying large language model on the edge is quite useful. For example, you run Copilot locally on your edge device, code completion, office, game chat, especially coding. Um, some enterprise data is privacy sensitive. You don't want to upload to the cloud. Um, but these devices are very resource constrained. Here, it's only a small, uh, less than already nano, resource constrained, low power, and also do not have access to the internet always. So privacy is important. Okay. So here with our tiny tech computer, you can ask it questions, uh, and also scroll up to see the previous answers. So basically, tiny chat uh, implements this four-bit compressed AWQ model. Okay, the weight is four-bit to save the memory footprint. And here we are doing um, running it on different laptops. This is running the code llama, so writing code using code llama, pretty fast. And this is um, comparing MIT Harvard. You use, give it different prompts, blazing fast. After lab four, you are going to implement something similar on your laptop, uh, lab, lab five. And feel free to continue improving that and pushing to the code base, Tiny Chat Engine's final project, which is open-ended, but this could be one of the choices. And the key technique to enable such fast inference is algorithm and system code design. Right? So on the algorithm side, four bit AWQ quantization. On the system side, is a tiny engine technique and parallel computing techniques. We introduced uh, loop and rolling, blocking, uh, cache locality, right? Um, and also multi threading, uh, CUDA programming, uh, different techniques. And also, how do we um, lay out the 4 bit weight in memory and runtime decoded from 4 bit to 16 bit to avoid this decoding overhead? Um, that is also one of the key techniques to make it run fast. And this is comparing on the 1490 GPU without and with 
and other fuel, how, uh, how far, how much speed up we can get, right? So that P16 version is storing both the weight and activation in yeah, P16. So that's 50 tokens per second running on 4090 GPU. Um, this is the AWQ version. Okay? The weight is only 4-bit. Activation is still 16-bit. Um, since this is the memory bottleneck, not the activation. So we keep activation in that P16 uh, to preserve the accuracy. And we run time decode the weight from in A in, in 4 by P16 and do the arithmetic in that P16 since computing is cheap. Memory footprint is expensive. This is exactly the way uh, we did in the efficient inference engine in ISCA uh, 16. Now this method is reborn and proved to be quite helpful uh, to accelerate this large language model uh, for real-time inference. It's not already finished. This one's still slowly making progress. And TinyChat is also flexible, support a lot of different large language models like MPT7B and Mosaic, Falcon 7B, and also Vicuna 7B. It can also run the uh, 13B parameter model on a MacBook, and even on a Jason Orin, which is a, a mobile GPU, mobile GPU, 30 tokens per second running uh, Llama 2. This is uh, telling some attractions in the Boston area, Freedom Trail, Museum of Fine Art, New England Aquarium, Fermi Park, all places I love. All right, so um, now let's switch gear from quantization to Brownian sparsity. Okay? Um, how do we exploit Brownian sparsity in neural net, in large language model? So this work, uh, Wanda tell us we should consider um, the weights and also the activations. So previously, magnitude is what we introduced in weight pruning. Look at the magnitude, if it is large, we keep it. If it is small, then set it to zero. So this is the after pruning, prune the weights. But Wanda is telling us we should, very similar to uh, AWQ, we should not only look at the weight, but also the activation is going to multiply with. Since large language all the time have to have super big Values, outlier values in the activation. So we should protect the weights corresponding to those large activations. Very similar observation as AWQ. If it is large, then we keep it. Otherwise, we uh, throw it away, set it to zero. So the resulting pruned weights, the mask is actually different from the original one. And it turned out to be. Uh, quite helpful um, compared with the magnitude based pruning, which is the first rule. So, take home is use weight times activation absolute value as a criteria rather than just look at the weight itself. There's also opportunity for activation sparsity, okay? not only the weight sparsity, but also the activation sparsity. So, this work from our group in HPCA 2021. For the Spaten, I uh, introduced this token pruning and had a pruning. Since the attention mechanism, if you recall, has no weight, QK transpose, softmax times V, that's it. They're all activations, there are no weights. So we have to prune uh, the tokens. And luckily, there's plenty of room to prune the tokens. Like here, we start with like, 11 tokens, but not all tokens are important. It's very safe to prune this sentence as a visual treat, the film is almost perfect, into as treat, film perfect in the first layer. Okay? So compress it to five tokens. Initially, it's 11 tokens. In the next layer, we'll continue prune it to two tokens, like film perfect. And still, we can classify the sentiment. The task is to the sentiment classification. It's still positive. Right? So therefore, um, we can do such cascade uh, token pruning. Why it's called cascade? Because we prune a little bit and then a little bit gradually we prune very aggressively. So how do we determine which token is going to be pruned away? Let's see this example. I bet the video game is a lot more fun than the film, similarly here. And we calculate the attention map 
is n by n attention map, right? And here we are going to see the cumulative attention score, cumulative attention score for each token. If the attention score is small, like a the, is, we are going to prune those tokens away. But those important tokens, those heavy tokens, like medial game, pretty heavy, 1.2, 1.7, we are going to keep it. So look at the attention map, prune it if the attention score is small across the whole column. So that's how we prune it. Uh, basically, that became cascaded token pruning and also cascaded head pruning. We can even prune away the entire head. Like Lama 2 has 16 heads, 32 heads, etc. We can uh, prune the entire head. We can also do the local value pruning. Right? If the QK transpose is small, we don't have to fetch the V. QK transpose is small, no need to fetch the V since it's not going to be useful anyway. So just look at the first BNM, calculate the QK transpose, and then see if it is big, thresholded, and don't, don't fetch the V, don't fetch the value if the T times very small. Finally, we can also do progressive quantization. Let's apply low precision first and see if you are confident. If it's not confident, how do we tell that? We look at the soft max. If it is very, very soft, then it means there's no one that is very significant. That means we are not confident. And what do we do? We fetch those high precision. Otherwise, we are having a very hot, very sharp um, uh, soft max distribution. Then we can tell we, we don't need to fetch uh, those uh, those MSB, uh, those LSB. Okay? So just use uh, this eager mode to do progressive quantization. And this uh, token pruning is actually quite widely used these days. Like three years later, this paper called H2O, heavy heater um, tokens, uh, proposed a technique to look at the generative autoregressive mode, also look at the attention map. Okay, This is a four by four attention map. The difference is that now it's autoregressive. So you only have this, uh, this half, bottom half of the attention map. You look at the attention score, cumulative attention score, for each column, if this column is small, then we prune it away. Okay, if it is small, then we prune away. And uh, those important tokens in this paper they call it heavy heater, heavy heater. And it's showing that in the in this way it can prune a lot of the uh, tokens in the in the KV cache. Compared with dynamic sparsity or static stratus sparsity or this window local sparsity. Uh, this static sparsity of H2O can find those heavy hitters, those important tokens, and prune those unimportant tokens in the KV cache. Um, the sparsity pattern may also be uh, may also be dynamic, which depends on the input. That's the contextual sparsity. Okay, so rather than using the static sparsity, which can give medium medium high sparsity, okay, which uh, the accuracy degrees very sharply uh, uh, as you remove more parameters. But this contextual dynamic sparsity can well maintain the accuracy even if you compress a lot. And here, um, the paper introduced a predictor using the feature map here to predict in the next layer uh, which attention has needs to be pruned and also which um, channels in the, uh, in the FFN layer needs to be pruned. You can run the predictor in parallel with the calculation of either the attention or the um, MLP layer and overlap the communication with the uh, predictor. And as a result, it can uh, bring uh, quite significant speed up. So this is input dependent sparsity. And also there is also the mixture of experts showing that for each input token, I don't activate the full network. Okay, so there are two um, tokens, more parameters, two tokens. Uh, one is act activating the second FFM, the other is activating the first FFM. So different tokens can be routed. So here we have a router, can be routed to different experts. So that's why we call it a mixture of experts. So here we have four experts. Um, this first token used expert two, second token used expert one. And the more expert you have, you tend to have 
uh, better um, better training loss. And here we define this capacity factor as the number of tokens per batch, like six tokens per batch in this case, divided by the number of experts. Like here we have three experts. Capacity factor, if it is one, then we have on average two tokens. Okay, we have two tokens. Uh, every expert can pro process at most two tokens. Although here, uh, three tokens are routed to device zero, the first expert is only taking two of them. And if this, um, this capacity factor is getting larger, like 1.3, now each expert can have a slack um, of, of slightly holding more um, requests. So this is cor corresponding to the capacity factor of 1.5. So six tokens can be routed into uh, three experts sitting on three different devices. And that's how we parallelize that. So this routing becomes very important in mixture of expert. Um, you can route it in several ways. You can either uh, choose the top K for each token across the expert dimension, like each token select your expert, or for each expert select which token you wanna you wanna serve, or you can do a global decision. You globally decide which expert to assign. All right, that completes the efficient inference algorithm part, including quantization and sparsity. Let's take a break before we jump into the systems. All right, welcome back, we have a lot to cover. So in the second part, let's cover efficient systems and also efficient fine tuning, starting with the uh, VLM. Before that, let's recap what is a KV cache. In the context phase, uh, there's no KV cache, but in the generation phase, the KV cache is very important concept. Like in this case, uh, we are having the uh, text generation task. I love Swinium, and then we are going to generate the next uh, the next token. Okay, So after we have x2, we are going to multiply um, the query, which is the query, query key value, a query of x2 with the, key, with the key of 0, and also key of 1, and also key of, key of 2. Okay? And we are going to use this um, as the weighted for the weighted sum to multiply with the value to get a weighted sum of the value for different v's. And then as you can imagine, as we generate more words, this, this KV cache is going to get pretty longer and longer, growing linearly with the sequence length. In last lecture, we calculated, uh, uh, we learned how to calculate the size of the KV cache, size of the batch size, number of layers, um, number of KV has, we can use MHA, if you remember, G, uh, GQA, um, and also um, um, to replace this multi head attention to reduce the number of KV, uh, KV has. And also in bending dimension, uh, the, the length of your sentence, um, K and V, that's the two values, two bytes for IP16. So that's two and a half megabytes per batch size per sequence length for Lama 7D. Okay? And if we have six users, sequence length is 4K, that require 160 uh, gigabytes to a 100 GPUs. So now we wanna solve this problem when you have more users, how do we um, shrink the size of the KV cache and try to squeeze as much um, as possible in, in a single GPU. So let's see, what is the problem when you are serving multiple users, right? Uh, say there are uh, two sentences. One is artificial intelligence is the future of technology. The other is like request B, LLM is blah, blah. When we are doing this, we have to pre-allocate the size of the KV cache for different um, requests to prevent this runtime um, allocation, which is pretty slow. We want to pre-allocate uh, this chunk of memory okay, to serve this task. What's the problem here? You don't know how long your sentence is, so you don't know how large should we um, should we allocate. And only way is we have to allocate um, as large, uh, relatively large value to prevent overflow. Right? So that immediately uh, resulted in uh, the external fragmentation. Okay? We are not using that, but we have to re uh, reserve that. So um, 
due to the different sequence length, some are long, some are small, different requests, you have external fragmentation. And also internal fragmentation, you have to over allocate due to the unknown sequence output length. Right? Um, these um, 2,000 tokens are wasted. And also the reservation um, uh, loss due to when you are generating like future, these are not generated yet. They will be generated in the future, but still you have to allocate this at this this timestamp. So wasting here, wasting here, and wasting here, which reminded us of what the operating system, right? When you're up, um, trying to manage the memory for different processes, like process one, process two, uh, they have the memory fragmentation. So this is the analogy between memories uh, between the operating system versus the large language model serving. You have two different processes, A and B. Uh, we, we can use a page table okay, to add one level of e-direction okay, to prevent such fragmentation. And also we can have other advantages like um, uh, control the um, um, access authority, etc. Uh, here we are having the same pattern, like different requests may require generate different lengths of sentences so we can dynamically allocate them by having a, something similar to a page table here at one level of indirection and use this KV block. Every time we allocate a block, okay, the maximum waste we have is the size of the block and then not rather than wasting a lot of memory in the KV cache, especially when we are serving different users whose requests may be of different lengths. So let's see how that works. So um, here we have a logical KV cache block. Okay, so different blocks, they're consecutive. When you are generating a sentence, it's like word by uh, token by token laid out in this way. And in each block, just like in each page, each page has four four k four uh, k bytes, and each block here, just as an example, is four blocks, uh, four tokens in each block. And this is the physical. Uh, KV cache block. Block size is the same, four tokens, and you have eight blocks. And then you have block table, just like a page table, to translate between uh, this physical block number into this uh, logical block number. So this is the physical block number versus how many slots are already filled. You can fill as, at most four tokens in each slot. So when we are generating the prompt, Alan Turing is a computer scientist, and, and let's let's watch this video and see it again. And so far, we are occupying two uh, pages, one page, another page. And every time, it's going to allocate a new token if the a new page if the number of slots is filled as full. This is logical block table and physical memory allocation. Interesting part is when you're getting renowned, it's not consecutive. They may be from a different physical place, but logically they are consecutive. And the translation is done through the, um, uh, the, the block table, mapping the uh, physical block number into the logical block number and counting the number of field slots. If the number of field slots is four, like in this case, it's four, we have to allocate another page in the physical memory. Like now it's full, then it has to allocate another block, block number three. So we put three right here. So let's see what happens when we have multiple requests. Okay, this is request A, this is request B. Request A is completing this sentence, and Turing is a computer scientist and mathematician. Request B is saying artificial intelligence is the future of something, right? And actually, they are sharing these physical um, KV cache blocks. Now we have eight blocks, and the green one belong to request B, yellow ones belong to request A. Um, they are interleaved um, so that we, we no longer have to uh, have this uh, worry about this external fragmentation since every time we just allocate a page, 
And the maximum of waste we have is probably three in this case. And the amazing part for large language model is that we can share, okay? so we can share um, the prompt when we are doing parallel sampling. Parallel sampling is saying the future of given the prompt, okay? uh, they can be shared across different uh, sequences. We pass it through the large language model and say, future of cloud computing is bright and poised for future growth. It's intertwined with the advantage of AI. It's likely to be characterized by several key trends uh, such ben uh, such um, parallel sampling is especially helpful when you are doing the co-pilot, uh, co like you are writing the code to give it a prompt. You want it to give you several suggestions, three different suggestions, you pick your favorite one. And in th this case, we can share um, this, uh, this prompt in the KV cache rather than having three separate uh, memory allocations. It's one memory allocation, Okay, the future of cloud computing is okay. Um, so two different um, requests they can use the same amount of uh, memory for the the same piece of memory for the um, for the prompt. Okay, so that's v, uh, VLM, V for virtual, and let's switch gear to jump into a streaming LM. Okay, now we handled multiple users in VLM. Okay, and multiple users, multiple requests. What about much longer sentences? You want to have a continuous chat with a virtual chatbot, like a virtual girlfriend. And how do we prevent it from uh, forgetting your stuff or getting out of memory? So uh, those are the streaming applications um, uh, where you want to run these multi-round dialogues with very long interactions, right? So conventional method, right, using the transformer um, and also windowed uh, attention, you can see uh, using a naive transformer the, as the input sequence length gets longer, the memory grows linearly. So a natural approach is, uh, although the memory is growing, that doesn't mean it's working well because if it is exceed your contact, your training contact length, the perplexity is going to hike, it's going to break. Okay, so after here, like 4K, where the training window size is 4K, the model quality is getting very bad. What if you use a window? Right? Can we just use a window uh, so that we can uh, use a limited amount of memory? So if you use window attention, that's the uh, green part. Uh, although the memory stays constant since we're using a window, see the perplexity suddenly broke when um, your sentence length exceeds the window length. Why is that? Because when the sentence length exceeds the window length, the first token will be evicted. And in this paper, we find the first couple of tokens are super crucial. We call it attention sync. You cannot evict them from the KV cache. Versus this streaming LM, um, the memory is constant and also the perplexity is pretty low, all the way to, this is 10K. Actually, we measured all the way up to four meeting. So this is the video demo without streaming LM versus with streaming LM. First model breaks, performance breaks, and then it becomes out of memory. While streaming LM, the model continues functioning for QA, 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 continuous functioning uh, without being stopped. So there are two uh, critical uh, failures. One is model performance breaks perplexity breaks, the other is out of memory. So let's see how do we solve those two problems. A natural approach to prevent it from uh, being out of memory is to just using a window, a window attention. Right? For every token, you just look at the here window size of four. Just look at four elements ahead of you rather than looking at everything in front of you. Okay? So in this case, the perplexity is um, T times L, so L is the number of cached tokens, T is the number of total tokens. Okay, so every time um, the, you have to calculate um, L, and then you have to calculate T times, why the, that's why the perplexity, the complexity is TL, but the perplexity is huge. Perplexity is huge. As long as when um, we exceed the KV 
the, the, the size of the heavy cache size, even are exceeding the window, the first token will be evicted, and then the model easily break. Another approach um, is the original approach. Dense attention, everything you calculate, everything ahead of you. The complexity is OT square area of this blue region. But the perplexity is big because you exceeded your training length. At training time, you have never seen such long number of tokens, therefore it failed. And this is potential it failed. The only way that works is by recomputing. So getting rid of the KB cache, everything that is computed from scratch, as if this token is the first token, you recompute the KB cache. So this area um, is actually L square. I've computed T times complexity is T L square. So although the perplexity is low, computation is just high without a fault. So what the interesting phenomenon we find is actually the first token is just so important. A lot of attention to the after layer two, many other layers randomly sampled there have a big attention to the first token. So the initial token have huge attention stores, even if they are not sem semantically significant. And we call it a uh, attention sink. So those tokens are disproportionately Received such a high attention irrespective of their semantics. And why? Uh, and also, we actually observed this three years ago when we are publishing the Spaten paper in HPCA 2021. Um, for example, this sentence he is a very famous researcher in the computer architecture era, area. And the new token papers uh, attend very heavily to the first token, he, but he actually doesn't have much semantic meaning. In the second example, when we are having that paper, that at that time, we are still using GPT-2 in late 20, in the fall of 2020, GPT-2 for language modeling. And we are doing a progressive token pruning, like Du Fu is a great poet of the Tang Dynasty. Uh, recently, a variety style that have been used in efforts, blah, blah. And actually, it tend to prune Fu was a great point, etc. Right? Why prune fu not do? That doesn't make sense. And actually, because do is the first uh, sync token. That's the attention sync. So we've observed this phenomenon like three years ago, but not until today. We figure out and have a, have a deeper understanding why that's the case. It's actually due to the softmax function. In the softmax, it has to sum up to one. Probability has to sum up to one. Even if some of the tokens are not quite important, it doesn't necessarily have to attend to each other, but the attention score must sum up to one for all the contextual tokens. So the initial token is special. Um, it has the advantage being the sync due to uh, it's the first one. All the subsequent tokens will attend to the first token due to the autoregressive manner. Um, therefore, uh, the word being predicted all attend to the first token. So since the softmax has to sum up to one, if something is not quite related, they just decided, the neural network just decided to dump all the attention scores to the first token. And that's the attention sync hypothesis. And we try to see whether it's the position that matters or the semantics that matters. So we try to replace the sync token with just slash n, which is a line break, doesn't have any meaning. But we find actually it performs function almost as well as using the uh, for uh, original token as the attention sync. Much better than doesn't have any attention sync, which is showing that the um, position matters. The first four tokens the position matters, not the semantic. Even replacing with line break still works. Very interesting phenomenon. Therefore, our solution is just to add back the first column as always, just always keep the attention sync, okay? and then do windowed attention later. So we are generating token seven. Um, assume the size of your uh, KV cache is eight. Now everything is a KV cache. When you are generating token eight, 
we keep the attention sinks, or in this case, skip four, and then using a rolling window manner for the remaining tokens. And don't forget to change the positional encoding. Um, for this is the attention sink, evicted token, rolling KV cache. We want to have the um, relative position in the KV cache rather than the original uh, uh, absolute uh, location position. So the positional encoding would be 0, 1, 2, 3. And then here is 4, it's not 6. So that's the only thing we need to change. And the integration with streaming LM with the page, the attention, the BLM is very simple. Just to pin the first page in the KV cache. Never evict the first page of the KV cache. Certainly, it will introduce a little bit of overhead since you actually just need to pin like four tokens, but a page maybe 16 tokens, but it's very easy to implement. Just pin the first page in the page attention and then change the positional encoding and then you have the VLM integrated with streaming LM. Actually, they already did the integration in the past two weeks, which is super exciting. So now we can uh, compare the dense attention with window attention with sliding window with uh, attention with recomputation versus streaming LM. Uh, previously, the window attention breaks when the month is greater than the KV cache size since the first sync token is evicted. And for the dense attention, the performance breaks once the month is longer than your pre trained uh, window size. Versus uh, this recomputation, uh, sliding window with risk recomputation versus streaming LM, they can both well maintain the perplexity. They pretty much overlap, so you cannot tell the difference having very low perplexity. But why not recomputation? There's a huge amount of computing overhead. So, and also, we tested all the way up to 4 million tokens. That's very long and didn't stop, stop working. So, uh, the model for different models, Llama 2, 7B, 13B, 70B, different models work consistently well, all the way to like 4 million tokens. It didn't stop. So now we compare with the only working baseline, which is sliding window width recomputation. Just get rid of the KV cache, recompute KV each time. Actually, we can make it um, reduce the latency from 1,400 to only 65 more than 20x speed up compared with that baseline. Um, saving the memory and also works quite well for different models. So how many attention sinks is needed? Previously we mentioned four, but why is that the case? Uh, we tried different um, configurations, like without the, KV, uh, without the attention sink, keep zero tokens in the front, the model the perplexity exploded. One attention sink, 11, 2 attention sync, 10, 4 attention sync, 9, and the 8 attention sync doesn't quite help. So that begins to plateau between 4 and 8. So we decided to use 4 tokens as the number of the attention syncs. But this still seems to be an arbitrary number. Why 4 attention syncs? If we have the um, luxury to train the model ourselves, can we train a large language model that only one? need one single attention sink with one dedicated attention sink. Okay. So we train the models from scratch in, by introducing an extra learnable token at the start of all the training samples okay, to act as a dedicated attention sink. And this is the uh, comparing the vanilla versus plus the sync token. Um, the pre-training loss is actually, actually a little bit better in this case, although this is a pretty small model, we have to verify that on a larger model, and call for collaboration here. Um, to verify adding this attention sync actually can also reduce the training loss for larger models. Um, this is showing the uh, cache config with only one attention sync. If we have the luxury to train the model from scratch using a learnable, dedicated learnable sync, only one token can match the performance with a pre-trained model that requires four tokens. So this is just population study showing that four is, as it looks like, to, uh, looks like a random number. Actually, we can use uh, pre-training to have only one dedicated sync token. But even if in that case, the sync token is crucial because without the sync token, 
the perplexity will explode. Later, people also verified this idea on the Mistral model. Remember, Mistral model is trained with windowed attention. So at times time, still attention sync phenomena is required. All right, next, let's jump into flash attention. Okay. Um, remember, the, cave, uh, the attention mechanism is pretty big. It's all in square memory. If you have to uh, materialize um, the attention map, everything in memory. But um, the memory is fast, then it becomes, uh, becomes small. It's slow, then it becomes large. So what if we, um, rather than materializing everything in the memory, how do we, can we do it on the fly? Okay, rather than materializing the large n by n attention matrix, so we try to uh, do it on the fly, compute block on SRAM, and um, the green part is in the DRAM, and as a result, it can uh, use this fused kernel uh, for QKT softmax uh, transpose and V. QKT transpose uh, normalization uh, softmax times V, everything merged into a single uh, kernel to avoid such large memory materialization and reduce the memory footprint. And as a result, it can be uh, much faster. This is showing the speed uh, without causal mask and also with causal mask. One is the GPT style, one is the BERT style. Actually, uh, the acceleration uh, with these two versions of flash attention is quite significant compared with naive PyTorch. The next cool technique is actually speculative decoding. So the decoding phase generates output tokens one by one, one token after another. Every token requires like seven billion parameter, like 14 gigabytes if it, without quantization, if it's Lama 207D, right? Can we, um, uh, can we use two models? Okay? One is a small model, one is a big model. This is not distillation, uh, by the way. One small model 7B, large model 175B. Uh, we can run the small model autoregressively, generate one token at a time. And when it generates K tokens, okay, we feed the K tokens all at once to the bigger model. So the bigger model is having a batch size of K. It's no longer doing one token. So it's, uh, the arithmetic intensity is actually larger. So it's no longer memory bounded in this case. Since for a large GPU, um, processing to K tokens, time, if K is not too big, is almost the same as processing one token due to the large parallelism. So the large model is going to decide uh, for each token I'm going to verify if that's a good prediction or not. If not, I'm going to reject it and start from over there. Like in this case, the small model is going to generate different tokens autoregressively, one after another. And after that, we feed these four tokens at the same time in a single batched manner, a batched manner to the large model, and verify each one um, if it is a good prediction or not. So the large model verifies it in a batch in a batch, batched manner. If it is not good, then we are going to correct it. So the green part is generated by the small model, depends benchmark bound. The large model uh, verifies these several tokens all together in a batch manner and find bond is not a good prediction. It's going to re replace it with another token. And then the small model is going to generate several tokens one by one again and feed it to the large model. The large model rejected the last one, replaced it with five, and similarly on and so on. So in this manner, um, if we are lucky, many of the tokens are actually in green generated by the small model without using 175 billion parameters, but only 7 billion parameters. But still we have the luxury of having a larger model to verify the correctness, um, but it's doing that in a batched manner to improve um, the arithmetic intensity. Since processing K batch is roughly the same time as processing a single batch if K is not too large and parallelism of GPU is large. All right, last section, lots of cool techniques, efficient fine tuning techniques. We always have to want to uh, customize our, our la large language model, but how do we customize a model that has like hundreds of billions of parameters? One way is to use low rank. 
So this is the pre true in the weight. Okay, they can be in the projection layer, in the um, FFN layer. And we, we only learn the bypass branch, not this branch. We freeze it, it's in blue. We only learn this bypass branch. Initially, you initialize with uh, identity. This is a uh, uh, random noise. This is initialized with zero. So uh, inference time is adding uh, no effect, but we can learn um, this bypass branch by using the low dimension here. The number of weights here could be uh, much smaller. So instead of learning the full weights, we learn the bypass branch, a small low rank component. And actually can re re receive pretty good accuracy at much lower number of trading parameters. Now, by the way, this is in log, so actually it's a huge amount of saving. This is low rank, low rank uh, adaptation for large language models. This is also the Q low rank. We can also have the quantized version. Uh, so this is the original full fine tuning. You have to store a lot of optimizer state, which is the same size of the model. Um, but using LoRa, uh, you're only learning this bypass, low rank bypass branch. Okay, so the optimizer state becomes much smaller since the amount of parameters needs to be updated is much smaller. But still, the base model is at P16. So QLoRa combined the idea of 4-bit quantization with LoRa. Um, basically, you can use a 4-bit transformer so that the inference time, you can use a smaller model. And at uh, um, update time, you can use the uh, P16 to, to update the low rank model. And in particular, they propose an NF4 format, which is similar to a, a K means classroom. They, they find a, the optimal sign choice given a normal distribution, which is defined a new data type, but they need to use the lookup table uh, to decode. And also, double quantization, applying the quantization not only to the weight, but also to the scaling factor, first to the weight and then to the scaling factor. And also paged optimizers with a CPU offloading. So if the optimizer state, some of them you can offload it to the CPU. And the next idea is using the adapter. Okay, so Laura basically add another bypass branch on the, in parallel with the main branch. So this is in series with the main branch. Okay, that's the adapter which is inserted into the main branch. After attention feed forward, it inserted an adapter layer, and similar here. So by, um, by using those techniques, we actually have to tune the model, right? You either have to tune the bypass branch or, or your feed forward branch is, uh, is quantized as QLoRa, or you tune those adapter layers, okay? So, in any case, uh, different tasks require different model. Can we use the same model by only tuning the prompt we gave to the model? Okay, so that's the prompt tuning, very widely used in industry these days. Previously, the prompt is discrete. Like here, uh, please summarize the following text. That's a prompt. We actually can train the prompt, to DP, back propagate all the way to the prompt for different tasks. You have, different, you have the same large language model. But by using different prompts, we can make it to do different tasks. You just prepend um, the prompt into each task. And the good thing about it is that the prompt is different, but the model is the same. Therefore, we can use batch the inference to handle different tasks. Previously, for different tasks, you have to different, use different set of weights. Now you're using the same set of weights, but just use different prompts. So Therefore, we can use um, the same um, model, just different model may have different prompts, and use the batch inference to handle uh, multiple batch, rather than having different models to handle different case. Now we have the same model to, have, to, handle, different, to do, handle different tasks. Like the ABC, three different tasks, we append it to the, to the beginning of our original prompt, and we feed the concatenated prompt, which combines uh, the task prompt versus our original prompt, and the task prompt can be trained, okay? So that we can take advantage of the same retrained model rather than having a separate retrained models. And here is that model tuning and prompt tuning. This is number of parameters, and this is 
the um, um, super glue score, actually um, the prompt tuning can almost uh, make it as good as the um, tuning the model, okay? When the model is getting bigger, when the model, model is getting bigger. Uh, compared with like prompt design, manually design the prompt, it's prompt tuning by using this learning-based approach rather than this rule-based approach. The learning-based approach can almost match the accuracy of fine-tuning the model. And to just give you some exposure, what we learned today, how it applies to industry and what is a real-world application. So very timely, Media released this Tensor RT uh, LLM last Thursday, which is state-of-the-art serving infrastructure from NVIDIA. And these are the techniques used in the TRT LOM in the official release, and all the green parts we have covered in the lecture. In today's lecture, in, in last Thursday's lecture, including multi-head attention, multi-query attention to save the KV has group query attention, uh, in-flight batching, page the KV cache, the basic the VLLM, um, and also the um, uh, quantization for smooth quant, uh, GPTQ, AWQ, FP8, covering early lecture, uh, rotary positioning and coding. And in the training section, we are going to talk about the tensor parallelism and also the pipeline parallelism. You know, um, everything is open source uh, in this library. Feel free to uh, check it out and run uh, these models. So that's, that's all for today's lecture, covering the efficient model compression algorithms in quantization pruning for large language model, both weight pruning and also activation pruning, um, efficient systems, including VLM, streaming LM, flash attention, speculative decoding, and also the uh, fine tuning techniques to update your model using uh, either changing the weight using LoRa, QLoRa adapter, or fixing the weight by changing the tuning the prompts. All right, that's all for today's lecture. We'll see you on Thursday.